This is your boy, Bill Forster. And today, Friday, um, I hope you had a good week. Uh, I have a very special guest with me, a good friend of mine that has a illustrious career in the music industry, DJing, promoting. I've had the pleasure, to be honest with you, and say that I've worked with him in all three facets of that. We promoted parties together. He's played for me personally. And I watched him be at a pinnacle of his career and still switch into the aspect. Probably one of a few people that I know was able to go back and forth with this uh, promotion and DJing. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you the legend. Legendary, Mr. Reggie Wells. Hello there, Bill. How you doing, Mr. <laughs> Foster? How are you, brother? Everything good? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. You know, thank God. God bless. And um, trying to keep my head above water with these crisis, you know, the crisis that's going on with this coronavirus. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Uh, shout out, you know, rest in peace to, uh, we lost another good brother, Wayne, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, rest in peace to I, Wayne. I um, that night. Matter of fact, yeah. I think he passed away last night, yeah. Right, right. Um, I was gonna ask you, how, how are you keeping up during this pandemic, um, which has affected all of us, this coronavirus, this COVID-19, whichever you wanna call it, which is something that I'm sure you and I in all our years of living, never thought we would experience or even be a part of something like this. How are, how are you holding up during this, uh, this, this crazy time in life? Well, so far, um, you know, like I said, I'm maintaining, I'm in the house a lot. Um, I wash my hands, got my mask on even when I go out. I make sure I stand six feet back. And at the same time, just doing things around the house, looking through some old pictures, uh, listening to some good music, and making phone calls. Not only, you know, I'm not dealing with everybody on Facebook, I'm reaching out to them directly. I want to hear their voice. You know, people could say they feeling, you ask them how they're doing, they're going to say, I'm okay. But when you hear their voice and you hear that tone in their voice, you can tell if something is wrong or something is good. So that's how I'm coping with this right now. You know, reaching out to my family, reaching out to people I haven't even talked to in a long time. Even though, you know, they're on my mind, but we didn't keep in contact on a regular basis. So when I do call them, they surprise me, and they, you know, they say, well, Reg, man, yo, you touched me, man, and I didn't expect to hear from you. I said, nah, man, you, you know, even though we don't talk on a regular basis, in the back of my mind, you're still a friend of mine. You know, it's so funny that you said that, because today I heard, I spoke to my old partner, Mike Eddy. Oh, okay. How's he doing? Mike and I, he's doing great. Mike Eddy and I, he told me to tell you hi. We toured at that time in the promotion game. And him and I just talked about old stuff. But the one thing that we did discuss is that time like this has brought us, make us pick up the phone call. Time shouldn't have lapsed so much that we haven't spoken to each other. You know, the one thing I think you and I, we converse a lot on the phone. We talk uh, in, in detail about life and just things, period, outside of just as friends, just like Red and I, Red Alert and I. We, used, we had made a promise that we would always talk once a month to each other just to check on each other. I think during to this pandemic that we have, people have picked up the phone, which is totally different than, you know, finding out what you did. Because how many people, Reg, you know, Reg, you know this, how many people have said to you, oh, I see you doing this or I see you doing that because they follow you on social media. But now right. picking up the phone, calling somebody, saying, hello, how you doing? is a total different animal because we're losing too many people. Popular popularity has become a curse for individuals like you and myself, where, mm -hmm. you know, social media at one point had just became a, a rest in peace a, a obituary. It's a social, right. a social obituary. Um, now, just during this whole pandemic and this, this quarantine, how have you, I know, how have you been able to uh, keep busy, like, you know, playing music? Are you playing social media? I know that's a big thing with the DJs right now. Or what are you just doing, like, going through your ar archives of, 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 of pictures and collages? Because I know one thing you always <laughs> a lot of pictures and collages, you know? Yeah, I have, well, I have quite a few pictures looking at 
do some more, looking through my portfolio and my books here, looking at some old pictures from back in the days when I used to have parties at the Crane Cup, La Barbeck, Justine's, just to name a few, 371. Yeah. Looking through some flyers too, man. I have uh, I have boxes full of flyers, man. And mm. uh, just reminiscing a lot of things that I've done in the past. And um, that's keeping me occupied. Plus trying to do some chores around the house. <laughs> and that's I'm important. The, <laughs> exactly. I'm the type when, you know, I, I'm so tired from being out late at night and coming home. I don't have time to hang up my clothes. So what I do, I just take them off, throw them on the side you know, of the chair and jump in the bed. And then the yeah. next day do the same thing and come home and they're piling up. <laughs> well, well let's, let's delve into that a little bit. I mean, I think, uh, like, I've been promoting since the late 80s, and even I adult. So, but I think at a certain time when promotional world, the promotion world was hopping. I'm talking about where we, especially somebody like yourself and myself, we partied almost four to five, six nights a week. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So let's let's get let's delve into the DJ, the that regiment. How did the name DJ get in front of Reggie Wells? Where did your career start? Well, you know, I'm, I'm up there in age right now, so I gotta turn back the hands of time. Yeah, you know, man. I'm getting a little C now. No, but <laughs> let me <start. laughs> Wow. Well, believe it or not, what kind of got me started or got, had, you know, I was interested in as far as being a radio announcer was uh, a DJ by the name of Hank Spann. Okay, That was yes. on WWRL. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frankie Crocker, of course, Gary Bird, the GBE or whatever. Um, Shout out to Gary Bird. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, Frankie Crocker, Vaughn Harper, but Frankie Crocker uh, and all of them, they was before Vaughn Harper. But, you know, listening to the AM radio, WWRL. And what I used to do, my voice had changed when I was at the age of like 13 or 14. So I used to mimic like if I was Hank Spann. So what I, <laughs> what I would do, right. I would come home and I would look in the telephone book. You hear me? Telephone book. <laughs> Okay. All and right. Was, yeah, because that's what that's what we had back then. We had a big back yellow then. telephone book or a white book. The yellow right. pages or the white. So what I used to do, I used to look through the telephone book and look for somebody under the name of Wells, right? So I would call them and turn up my radio and have the phone right next to the radio while the music is playing. Mm -hmm. And I would call them and act like I was on the radio station. I said, good evening. Is this the Wells residence? And they said, yes. I said, if you could name your favorite radio station, I've got a grand prize selected just for you. And they'd be like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you was pulling the wool over people's eyes. Yeah, yeah. Huh? So what happened, um, I remember I was listening to the radio station. They said, how would you like to be a DJ in your own spare time? And I'm saying, really? And there was a broadcasting, a broadcasting school downtown in the Times Square. So I went down there and I'm sitting up there in the office waiting for this lady to come out from the back. And on the wall, they had all these famous announcers, newscasters, radio personalities, tele, um, television announcers. And I'm saying, what the hell in the world am I doing here? <laughs> wow. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> And I was getting ready to walk out the out the office, and the lady came out. She said, "Well, can I help you?" I said, "Well, since I'm here, I might as well just go ahead and, and try this out." But and the, what I'm saying, what really got me started because my voice had changed. It got deep at the age of 13 and 14, and I was always mimicking a DJ. Even when I was at the world famous Apollo Theater, my mother used to take my sisters and I to the world famous Apollo Theater. And if you ever been there back in the day, mm -hmm. um. Before the show started, the announcer would come on and say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the world-famous Apollo Theater. Right now, yes. it's showtime. <laughs> so that's what got me interested. And from there, who really got me started in the business, I know you haven't heard his name for a long time. His name is Jerry Robach, Jerry Production. Yeah, okay. He was promoting before I started. I was playing basketball back then, but him and I were seeing 
uh, the, uh, two sisters. You know, he was seeing one of the sisters, I was seeing the other, and I was being in the living room late at night, and he would get up around about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, walk out the house with all these damn flyers, and I used to ask her, I said, where is he going? She said, to promote. I said, promote what? Well, he's giving a party. So he used to hear me in the living room at times just, you know, acting like I'm a DJ. So one time, he said, well, listen, man, that sounds pretty good. Why don't you come down to the La Martinique? Do you remember the La Martinique? That was the old Silver Shadow. Wow. 57th okay. Street. So I got, he, he told me to come down there. I got on the microphone just talking garbage. You know, sweeter than a mosquito with your mama standing in a serious tuxedo. Got more clothes than she wear pantyhose. Do more gigs than she wear wigs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the hell I was talking about. But, but you were saying it, though. That's all that matters. I was right? saying it. So whatever I was doing, they was liking it. And, and you know, from there, there was other promoters in the house. And they liked the way I sound. And they hired me. See, at that time, I wasn't playing music. I wasn't really playing music. I wasn't DJing. I was just like announcing like what KC was doing. Right. You know, just on the microphone. You know, so but um and at the time my name wasn't Reggie Wells. I had a name. What was it? It was Nikki B from CC, Chocolate City. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know you glad you went back to Reggie Wells. How did, how yeah, because you know I said how my name see? on the play. <laughs> It was funny when the guy made up the flyer and said, we featuring um, Nikki B from CC and I'm all excited and everything. And I'm trying to show the fly out to my friends. And they said, who the hell is Nikki B? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Said, yeah. B. Nikki B. But anyway, and I thought about it as time went on. I said, man, listen, this is, you know, they got Frankie Crocker, they got Gary Bird, they got uh, Jerry Bledsoe. I said, so Reggie Wells, Sounds like it could ring some bells and raise some hells. So I said, let me just, you know, Reggie Wells. That's it. Right, right, right. And I stuck with that. Yeah, that's how it went. So so that's how you started grabbing the mic, because you um do have a talent in, in, in rocking the mic back then. I mean, along with big shout out to DJ Hollywood too, another legend that was definitely known for rocking the mic. So let me ask you a question. How did you get into DJing? Because so you started off being an MC first, like MC, right? KC, right. KC, the prince. They call me the man with the golden voice. There you go. Exactly. They right? talk more shit than the tall boat can flush. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's what we want to hear tonight. That's what we, we want to hear that Reggie. Bring that Reggie back. Exactly. So, so let me ask you a quick. Go ahead. Yeah, tell us how you got into actually playing music along with talking. All right, believe it or not, I, I, you know, I was at this place called A Bunch of Grapes on 125th Street. I was with a friend of mine, and as a bar, and um, we were sitting at the bar, and I heard this DJ playing. It was really nobody in the bar, but he was playing. Then he was on the microphone. So I got up from the bar, walked over there to the DJ, I mean to the DJ booth, and I was standing there watching him, listening to him. And believe it or not, it was Hollywood. Really? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I introduced myself. We he knew of me, but I really didn't know of him at the time. Okay. And but he sounded good. Right. So what happened about a month later, my friend, the same friend of mine, we was up in the Bronx going to, um, what was it? Uh, it was a roller skating ring on Webster Avenue. I don't, I, I can't remember the name. But anyway, make a long story short. Yeah, I'm not gonna go back that far with you. I ain't, I'm trying to act like I ain't that old. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, yeah, I know anyway, make a long here. story short. We was riding coming up the block, uh, going coming up this block, and we saw these young ladies coming out of this place that looked like a warehouse. And turn around, we asked them, we said, where y'all coming from? They said, yo, it's a club down here. I said, a club? They said, yo, y'all need to go. So turn around, uh, we parked the car, went downstairs. And again, I run into Hollywood. <laughs> OK, all right. So Hollywood, he was telling me, you know, he said, he said, yo, Raz, get on the microphone. Get on the microphone. So I was on the microphone popping what I know. 
it wasn't rapping like he was rapping. Like, say, I was rapping over the music, and I wasn't rhyming with the music and having audience participation. I was just, you know, saying slick stuff. So what happened in the process when I was doing that, in the process, the owners heard me, and they was in the process of opening up upstairs, building upstairs. And they came to me. They said, well, listen, I like the way you sound. Listen, um, are you interested in working with us? We're building upstairs. They said, well, you, you know, you want to be one of our DJs. And I told them, I don't know how to play no music. <laughs> they said. <laughs> really? You tell them you didn't know how to play music? I, I didn't know how to play no music. I said, I just own the microphone. They said, well, the only way you're going to learn if you try it. And I thought about it. And I said, hey, fine. You know, I took the job. So turn around, the funniest thing where 371 at that time, it was called, three, at the time it was called House of Glass. Then they changed it to 371. Okay. That's so, a, so all y'all um, who listening out there, exactly. Right, right. So what happened, it was the funniest thing. The club was so hot. I mean, the line was so long. I was upstairs, Hollywood and Junebug, rest in peace, was downstairs. Right, rest in peace, June. Yep. Right. And the line would be so long where they would, come in, the line would be upstairs inside of where I play at in Hollywood, and they hang up their coat and they go straight downstairs. Nobody come upstairs to me. <laughs> they wasn't even paying attention to you. They was going straight to the right. they was so going to when the crowd, When it got so crowded, they didn't have a choice but to come upstairs. Right. So I was playing musical chairs. When I say playing musical chairs, when I was playing, I, I would play about three or four records. And the fifth record, they sit down. The the next record, they get back up because I couldn't maintain them on the floor. <laughs> my mixer wasn't that, that great and my selection wasn't that great. Okay. So as time went along, as time went on, what I did, um, I would come in early, I would play. I'll play for the small amount of people that's in the house right then and there. So when they was on the floor and they stayed on the floor for those three or four records, I put that on the side. That fifth record, I put that on the other side where I know when it gets crowded, they're not going to dance to that, but they're going to dance to these other three or four that I played. So by the time when the crowd came in, I had my whole, you know, art I had my whole program ready, even though I didn't play by program, but I knew by the small amount of people that was there early, I could play and put all those records together that they was dancing to. I put all those together and played, but my timing still was off. But as time went on, you know, I picked up on it as far as learning how to mix. Not scratching, mix, blending. Okay, so so let me ask you a question. So. You, you get this job, you don't really know how to play. So now you're watching, like you said, you, you're playing four, four, other, four songs and then maybe the fifth song, people sit down. Right. When did you say, okay, you said you started into, you started rocking the people when they coming in and, and, and I, all these shout outs of people are saying hi to you. Definitely after this interview that was over, go back and say hi to them. But that being said, don't look now because I don't want to lose you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I would lose you. I got you. I got it. I'm replying to them. Unless they have some questions. And anybody that have questions for Reggie, please uh, let me know and I'll give it to them. Um, so how did you feel? Like you like, yo, they're all going to Holly. Uh, yeah, you're hired as a DJ, but right now you're really a, a, a technically an MC. So you're learning on the fly. Right, right. So and it's been like the moment with the king yeah. right there in front of me, which is a good experience because you can see what you're doing. You know, you have some DJs that had equipment or have equipment, they home, they practicing, you know, back and forth and turn around. They don't see their audience. They don't see how they respond to what you're playing to by the audience being right there in front of you. Because a DJ, when you play, you create the environment, you maintain and you, 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 you know, you have to maintain them on the floor. You, and when you're playing, you got to communicate with your music. You're taking them somewhere. You know, not just to be playing, just to be playing. Playing where you taking them from one level to the next. And you're just taking them up, taking them up. Like you got a low tempo song. And the first record that you play, you should have them on the floor. And once you have them on the floor, even if the floor is not crowded at that time, you keep the ones that you have on the floor, and the next song that you play, 
you 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 get more people on the floor. Then the next song you play, more people on the floor. So now you got a party going on. Now once you have them, you got to take them. And when you take them, you're taking them to a destination where they're having fun, they're drinking, they're laughing, and they're just giving all what they got. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? A lot of times people don't understand. Back in the days when we promoted, there was one DJ. Oh, yeah, yeah. So how? Did, let me ask you a question, and, and we're going to get back into the history. But let me ask you a question. How do, do you see what today, like today you'll have three, four DJs on a bill, which some people do, some people don't. It is what it is. But as a DJ, what was your point? I heard you just say you kept taking them to another level, another level, another level. Right. But but if you're starting a party at a certain time, the compilation of songs that you had to think about, tell, tell me the mindset of the DJ. Like, are you going to play R&B, love songs? What, like, like what, what, what was right. your in, 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 Okay. In First of all, I feel strongly, mm -hmm. and this is my opinion from my experience, that a DJ should never play by a format. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, say for example, you're the house DJ, right? You're there every Thursday, every Friday. And a lot of times you have the same people that come every week and then you might have some new people. So now if you plan by a format, they know what's coming next. Yes, they, okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you plan by a format, I remember I was playing with the DJ at Just Things. I'm not going to mention his name. You know, he was there before I got there, before they hired me. And he was playing by a format. He had it down packed to the point where the doors open up at 6 o'clock. He know that the crowd won't get in there until around about 7. So, and this is what he's going to play at 7 o'clock. And it was like, okay, if they wasn't there at seven, they can't. <laughs> he's all messed up. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. all messed up. Then you had DJs that they had a pad, and they would look at their pad, knowing what they was going to play next, instead of playing from the vibe, playing from your feelings, playing know the beats per minute. Now, like today, the laptops today, oh my God, some of the DJs they got it good. Because when we was playing turntables, we didn't know beats per minute. We had to work. We had to work that pitch control. We had to feel it from our soul, our heart, and the rhythm and the timing. You know, you could go on the laptop today. You might not know what you want to play next. All you could do is just look at the laptop. Oh, this record that I'm playing right now is 115 beats per minute. Oh, let me find a song that's 115 beats per minute because they know that should go together. Back then, you know, we didn't have that. We looked through our crates. You had to know your music. You had to know your music. And you set up your crates to the point where how I used to do this and when I set up my, matter of fact, I have my crates. I have about 67 crates in the hallway right now. There I ain't you gonna go. show you. Nah. <laughs> I still have my vinyl. I still have my vinyl. That's what's I'm scared up. to get rid of it. Don't, don't, but, don't. Yeah. Well, it's taking up too much room, man. It's taking up too much room. It like part of the damn furniture and shit, you know? <laughs> but um, playing by format is not good because you never know anything could change, you know? Mm -hmm. A different clientele could come in where what you played last week, you might be able to play something different this week. And that's what I learned by leaving 371. Now, 371, that was one of the best clubs that I played for, which was up there in the Bronx on 166th Street and Clay Avenue. One thing I love about the club, it was, it was because it was family oriented. When I say family, I'm talking about the staff. I'm talking about management, the owner, the people behind the bar, the security, and the DJs, but we was competing against each other all the time. Even How though we were there. there. How many DJs were in there? Who were there? It was four. The original ones, when I first came, it was Junebug and Hollywood, right? When they built upstairs, it was me by myself. Okay. Then Eddie Chiba came along because he was working at Charles Gallery, which is on 125th Street. Right. Shout out to when Eddie Chiba. Yeah, yeah, when Charles Gallery burnt down, 
Eddie Chiba came up to 371. So now him and I working together and Eddie Chiba and June Bugs, so the four of us. But then okay. as time went on, we had Michael P. Okay. Uh, okay. We had Richard Hot. Starsky would drop by, rest in peace. Uh, Flash would come through. We had quite a few DJs that would come through, you know. Um, uh, and But the original DJs was myself, Hollywood, June Bug, and uh, Eddie Chiba. How long did 371 exist, Reg? Uh, it had a good run for about a good five years. Yeah, because the bottom line is a lot of us don't know. In, 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 in promotions, clubs, venues, a lot of times the life expectancy is, is very short. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, could, like, you could say a promoter like myself or anybody like yourself, you could, you could be out, and we'll get into your promotion a little later, but... Oh, me and Sparkle Entertainment, shout out to Sparkle. We were talking like a promoter's real run maybe have seven straight hot years. You may promote 20, 30, 40 years, but yo, when you were the pinnacle of success is, is not a long thing. So you guys are promoting 371, because let me tell you something. If you're talking about a certain age group, everybody went to 371 in the Bronx. Right, the house of joy and fun. That's what it was. <laughs> so... You guys, like you said, you're still competing against you, you, yourselves. When, when does Reggie leave 371? Do you, does Reggie leave 371, or does 371 close down and Reggie has to go on to another uh, avenue? No. Um, what happened, 371 was before Disco Fever. And Sal, Sal, if you're out there, how you doing, Sal? I remember when Sal had came to 371 and he approached me, and I guess as well as the other DJs. And I remember, you know, he wanted to know if I was interested in playing at Disco Fever. But at that time, why would I leave 371 when that was one of the hottest places to be at? So why would you leave some, and you, you know, where it, and you already, built it up. You built it up. Right. Too. And where it was established and go somewhere else to start all over. So uh, as time went on, Junebug had left okay. and went over to Disco Fever. Um, as time went on, Eddie Chiba had left and went over to Broadway International. You remember on, uh, on oh, Broadway? I, I, you know, that's my era, baby. That's it, Broadway International. 146th yeah. Street off of Broadway. Right. 146th off of Broadway. Right. Then Hollywood, he was working so much, you know, outside of 371, where out of the th four originals that were started there, I was left. You know, I, I would be there. But what happened, I ended up playing downtown on Tuesdays after work at Justine's for Scotty Flash and Herman M. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Herman M and friends and Scotty Flash. Yeah. So what happened, I always wanted to work downtown, even though I had worked down, I mean, as a DJ, not as an MC, because I was doing the Hotel Diplomat, Ipa Neemers, yes. uh, Casablanca, one and name two. Name them, name them, name them, brother, name them. Yeah, yeah. Psychedelic Shack. <laughs> 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 you know, you had Savage, you had Pegasus, you know, but anyway. Leviticus, all kinds right, of spots. Leviticus. Yeah. You know, and at the and now see what happened when I was working for as for Scotty Flash or Herman M on Tuesdays after work, the Dow Twins, which was the managers of Justine, like what I was doing. So then they asked me would I be interested in playing on a Thursday. So I said, Well, I'm up at 371 on Friday and Saturday, so that wouldn't conflict with what I was doing there. So I ended up playing at Justine's on Thursday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. So now I'm working with Scotty on Tuesdays. I'm working for the Dow Twins on Thursday. Okay. And then I'm, I'm up at 371 Friday and Saturday. So you know what we talked about earlier. We out there four or five days out of a week. Exactly. You know? Right. So uh, what happened as time went on, 371 you know, people started going elsewhere. People was going to Disco Fever. People was going to Broadway International. 
So then you didn't want to burn, burn your bridges by staying in and it's not the way it was when you first started. So I thought it was the right time for us for me to leave, which I ended up going to Justine's at, and being the house DJ, working there uh, Tuesday for Scotty Flash, Herman M and Friends, and working for the Dow Twins Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So I left from there and that's when I, and I was at Justine's for about 10 years. Okay, why so short? 10 years is that strong. You said 10 years. I'm sorry, I think you said 10 weeks. I'm sorry. 10 no, weeks. 10 years. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Well, Justine's was a great run, brother. Was oh, a yeah, run. it was a great run. No, no, you know, because Justine's had, which was the best of friends. The Dow Twins was affiliated with other people over at, see, they had Justine's, the same people that owned Justine's owned Leviticus. The same right. people that owned Leviticus and Justine owned Bogart's. The same people that owned Bogart, Justine's, and Leviticus owned, I think it was Lucifer's, which was out okay. there in Brooklyn. Then they had Manhattan proper. Okay, so they yeah, they, they had the city. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, and it was black owned. Yeah. I'll give that to them. Yeah, I'll give them credit on that. And plus yeah. 371 was black owned. There you go. And so uh by me playing at Justine's, I, I would play at Justine's and times I would go and play at Leviticus. Then I would go play at Bogards for them. Then I'd come back and play at Justine's. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing about Justine's, which was a learning experience, man, because 371, even though I had a lot of fun there and I enjoyed the people that was there, but the crowd that was coming there was limited with music. And when I say limited, you couldn't really branch out and play a variety of music. And you could play. Whatever was hot at that time, it might have been 25 records hot at that time, like Peter Brown, T Connection, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you know, Love is the Message, Before I Let Go by Beverly, Frankie Beverly and Mays. But you could take those 25 records or 30 records to max and continue playing them over and over again. And they would not care as long as they, they love that song, that shit is hot, they would dance that shit all night. Let so what happened? Let me, let, me, let me interject. Let me ask you a question. Now, I've spoken to Red about this, and I've spoken to DJs just from being a, a promoter. Like, sometimes DJs can get stereotyped in, in playing music, but the one thing that everybody knows, when they hear, when a DJ plays music, they want to hear what they want to hear, right? Now, this, you said something very important about expanding the listening ear. Mm -hmm. Was that hard for you? as a DJ to implement new music into your listening audience at, when you at clubs or any place else. So look at it like this here. Say, um, you know, when you work for a radio station, you have a, mm -hmm. a program director, you have a music director, right? Program director could program the show, music directors, music directors could select the music that you're going to play on the air. Yeah. Now, when you're a DJ and you playing in, you playing in a club, you everybody in one. You're that program director, you're that music director, and you're that DJ. Okay. And you see your audience on radio. Think about it. If you're in your house or you're in your car and you're listening to a radio station, and say for example, the station at that particular time is not playing something that you like, what would you do? You would switch to another one. Right? Yes. It's the same thing in the club. If I'm playing music in front of this audience here, and if I'm not playing the right music for the majority, what they're going to do? Sit down or leave the floor. So what I was about to say when I left 371 and went down to Justine's, I was doing my job, but I would never forget this here. The guy came to me. He said, Reg, yo, I'm going to give it to you, man. You're rocking, but you just played that shit an hour ago. <laughs> kind of like, uh, dude, yo, um, get your shit. I said, oh, I said to myself, wow. So, and then when I said you was able to branch out and play a variety, think about it and listen to me, because you're in the heart of Manhattan. Right. You had all the boroughs coming there. Like Everybody had, came to Manhattan. Everybody right, came to Manhattan. Yeah, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, even Staten Island, even yeah. Jersey. So you had a variety of people coming to this one club where you could 
that's where you could branch out. And then when people would come to me and they would request a certain song, even though I would take requests, but I wouldn't take a lot, but they would request certain songs and I would remember that or I would, if I had a little pad in my book, I would write it down and then I would go home because I'm in a record pool and I knew I had that song. I would listen to it and I would bring it to the club or whatever. And then, you know, I fed off of them. And if the majority likes it, you know, and, and I could play it. Better, let me tell you something. We was playing punk rock at Just Things. B-52 and all that. I can't hear you, man. You can hear me? Oh, yeah, I hear you now. Yeah. There you go. We I'm was playing too. punk rock. Punk rock, man. And, you know, I was the type of guy where, DJ, where I was looking for new music. I was buying back in the day in the 80s. You you remember import? They was called imports. Okay. That means a lot of you know songs that we wasn't playing here that was on the radio. They I would go to, I don't know if you remember the record store Rock and Soul. I was just about to bring it up to you. I was about to ask you. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I was a promoter and I went to Rock and Soul. <laughs> just right, right, right. Let me tell you something. Every DJ that ever, if you thought you would, no matter what your pecking order was as a DJ, you went to Rock and Soul. If you ain't buy a record from Rock and Soul, I don't know what to tell you back in the day, especially from the right. 60s, 80s, and 90s. How long did the Rock and, uh, Rock and Soul, let me tell you something, that little- They still, they still exist until this day, believe it or not. Really? Get they out just, of here. They're at, they're at a different location, but okay. they're not too far from the original location. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. And, and, and let me just say this here too. I'm gonna give credit where credit is due to the brother that worked at Rock and Soul. His name was Eric. And he was such a good guy. He was into music. And when I would come into that store, he would put certain music aside for me. He said, Raj, man, I got something for you. I want you to listen to. And you remember what they did? They had two two different places where you could take the record out, out the cover. And you can listen to it right then and there. You remember that? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And man, I always, I should always say, man, Eric, thank you, man. He helped me out a lot with some new stuff. I was just trying to break records, man. And I was, you know, I didn't wait until the radio station uh, uh, played songs on the radio. Matter of fact, the record pool that I was in, which was real record pool and disco then, we had so many DJs, but yet we had primary DJs like myself. We, had, we had worked at primary clubs. And what we had to do is about 10 of us. And we had to report our top 20 to the radio station, what we was playing in clubs at that time. You know, okay. because the radio was feeding off what was going on in the streets at the time. Yeah. And then at the time, at that time, I mean, a lot of artists used to come to me, man. So, I mean, right, I, okay, I'm Curtis Blow. When, believe it or not, I have, I have, I have, it's called an acetate. An acetate is where, you know, artists in the, in, in, the, in the studio, they're recording their song. When they finish the product, they would master about three or four or five of them. And they would go to primary clubs or well-known DJs that have a large clientele or audience. Uh -huh. And they would bring them that song. And I remember when Curtis brought me These Are The Breaks, right? And he, brought, and he was sitting up. He said, yo, Reg, we just came out the studio, man. Yo, check it out. Check it out. He said, man, you going to play it for me? You going to play it for me? And, you know, what I would do, I, I took the record out of the cover. I put it on the turn to me while something I was playing, I'm listening to. I started from the beginning. Then, you know, back in the day, you look at the groove on the record. Cause if it's, if it's look like it's blank, you know, that's a break part. <laughs> and look, and, a lot of people out there, tell them some history, Reg. Yeah. As a DJ. As a matter of fact, Curtis and some other artists, man, you owe me a gold record, even though I didn't produce it, but I played it. First in the school, so straight out the box, hot off the press. Remember that. Facts and facts. Gold records that I do have. Thank you. I'm not going to name the artists, but I do have quite a few. But anyway. Shout out to Curtis Blow if you're listening. Curtis, Curtis Blow. Blow. That's right. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, listen, Reg, let's talk about Curtis Blow. A lot of people don't know. Curtis is from Harlem, like a lot of people. Oh, that, she oh, was just in okay, college no, no. too, right? Let that me tell like, you something. You Russell. We we who was in City College 
with me at the time. We was at we was in city at the same time. It was myself, Curtis Blow, David Lee. David Lee, you froze up, but I'll wait for you. Come on back in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a legend in the building. He's talking. He's um, there he is. He's Keith back. Sweat. Yes. Keith was singing with the group. Keith, yeah, Keith used to sing with a group called Jamil at that time. Um, okay. Ray Simpson, Valerie Simpson's brother, Asher and Valerie Simpson. He's the lead singer for us for the village, village people today. Really? Uh, really? Bobby Gales, who was a radio personality for WBLS in 98. Oh, Bobby Gales, yep. Mm -hmm. Right, and he's in Washington, D.C. now. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Allison Williams. I oh, might, hold, hold that thought. Allison Williams. I'm not sure. I think she was. But hold anyway. On, no, there's a whole other thought. I just got a big, a big shout out to Allison Williams. If you're listening right now, Allison is one of the first original Real Talk members. She's a co-host that she hasn't been here yet. We're going to bring her in, implement her in this. But Allison was very instrumental in me starting Real Talk Chronicles. So I have to give her a props. The first lady of Def Jam. People need to know that. First lady of Def Jam. That's right. Oh, go ahead, Reggie. Go ahead. Keep on, brother. Yeah. So all of us was in um, City College at the same time on Thursdays. I was, I, matter of fact, I was on the school radio station, WW, WCCR. It was on the 64, on, what, 64 on the AM down. Mm -hmm. um, I was, um, Bobby Gales was on the radio station at the time. David Levy, he was on our radio station at the time. So, um, yo, we had some interesting people back then and how I got on the radio station because I used to play basketball. I used to play for the Gauchos and Riverside Church. A lot of people didn't know, Reggie got a little skills, got a little skill. Got a little skill. <laughs> A-Y-A, C-B-L. Um, I played a lot of plays. As a matter of fact, my trophies is right over here on the piano, but I don't want to show you all that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, what happened when I was playing for City College and, you know, I, I end up uh, not doing well in one of my classes, you know, you have to maintain a certain average. And oh, yeah, I, I, I found that out the hard way. <laughs> 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 playing ball, so, too. So, I, I found yeah. that out. So turn around, um, I end up, you know, they, they kicked me off the team, even though I was supposed to go to summer school or whatever they had in the summer. Mm -hmm. I didn't go, so that that's how I stopped playing basketball. Then I I joined the school radio station. But uh yeah, but Russell man, let me tell you, Russell, if you're out there, man, how you doing, man? Yo, keep up. Shout out to Russell work. Simmons, baby. Yeah. yeah. And I remember when Russell, we would walk from one side of the campus to the next, and you know, he always wanted to start his record label, record label. I never thought he would be able to do that because he never went to class. So what do you know about business? <laughs> Everyone said, you know that's the truth, man. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Keith, man, Keith used to be singing in the lounge, singing in my air, and I used to tell people. Hey, <laughs> like, come on, man. Yeah, I said, Keith, you can't sing. And believe it or not, you know how people always talk about, you always saying, baby, baby, baby. He was yeah. saying, baby, 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 before he even, you know, signed a record deal with Electric Records. He was singing his record. He was begging back then, Reg? <laughs> he was begging back then. But shout out, shout out, to Keith, shout out to Keith Sweat, Harlem's own. Yes, you know, but yo, it was a great experience, man. And, you know, um, and uh, it was a, it was, it was nice. What more can I tell you? Yeah. So, so we so, we still friends until this day. You know? and, and that's a beautiful thing. You know, um, a lot of people don't understand. We've all made money together. We've all done a lot of things. Now, I tell people a lot of times. They are not privy to the way we used to party. I even tell my wife Malika that I said, I wish we were married when we partied back then. <laughs> Maybe I don't know if we would have been married, we might have had a, some arguments unnecessarily. But the bottom line is back then we partied to a sense. Like Reggie, you are your name goes off a lot of spots. People don't even know about Red Parrot. What was the other spot? Justine's. Name the spots that, that your name rings bells with, please. Wow. <clears throat> oh, okay. Let me give you a little history. Um, I was playing at a Bentley's before it was Bentley's. It, exactly. was, called Shea, it was called Shea Chic. 
Okay. People remember the Silver Shadow, which was called La Martinique. That was before the Silver Shadow was called La Martinique. Uh, Justine's was called Lola's, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Leviticus was called the Sandpan. <laughs> so um, where I played as a house DJ was 371, was Justine's, was the Red Parrot. Um, those are the three major clubs that I played for as a house DJ for a long period of time. So, but what happened when, you know, you know, and I'm gonna tell you something which so many DJs don't understand. You know, you become a house DJ for a club, and that's where you play each and every week, you know, each and every Friday and Saturday. And you commit yourself, you're there for a long period of time. And then when the club closes, some of the DJs don't know what to do with themselves. You understand? Right. They right. that doesn't mean that your career is over. You was working for the establishment, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So yeah. now when Red Parrot closed, even though I was a promoter, I was working with Jerry Roebuck, Harold Maynard, and myself. We was doing college parties back in the day. But when uh, but when the Red Parrot closed, not only did they close, uh, <laughs> the original hey. owner fired me. <laughs> you, want, you, want, you want to tell us why he fired you? <laughs> oh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me explain. OK, this is how it went. Herman M, which I used to play for all this, all of his events, right? The boat rides, uh, all his, uh, you know, parties at the Harmony Park Central Hotel, whatever. Right, 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 okay. right. I was at his main DJ. So then, when Red Parrot decided to go R and B, because Red Parrot at one time was all white club, and when the Palladium opened up, which was on 14th Street, matter of fact, I played at the Palladium. That was a beautiful club. Do you remember that? I, and I, I played that Studio I played that Studio 54 with Steve Rebell. Okay, all right. You, you, know? drop us, you drop us some jewels on some people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> drop us some um, names. And what happened? I'm trying to make this plain and simple. What happened? Herman collaborated with the owner of Red Parrot because then they started, they wanted to go R&B, okay? okay? So Herman brought me in six months or seven months later um, so, uh, down the line. Herman, things wasn't going right with the owner, owner and Herman, but the Red Parrot was hot. And Herman told me, he said, well, Reg, man, I'm getting ready to leave. He said, but if you want to stay, you could stay. And I'm thinking about it, what they paying me? The club is beautiful. It was one of the hottest clubs in Manhattan at that time. I mean, and I decided to stay. Fine. So once Herman left, the club, the owner tried to promote the club on its own. Okay. He didn't know how to promote bars for a black clientele. At the time, he was getting Savannah, Kid Creole, and the Coconuts to perform. <laughs> to perform at the Red Parrot. The right. crowd started, you know, they, they wasn't coming back. I gave them, and plus they cut my pay. Even though I started, you know, I stayed there. They cut my pay. I, I was willing to take shorts because I know they wasn't making the money. But as time went on, I started giving them ideas. I told them about Bobby Brown. They didn't know who the hell Bobby Brown was. That's when Bobby Brown had just left New Edition and he went solo, right? Okay. I said, you get Bobby Brown in here, yo, believe me, this place will be packed. They have Bobby Brown. I got them now, from now, the I, I want to say that's when I officially met Reggie Wells through. Rome. Right, because you worked there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, Red, um, let me tell you something. That spot was off the chain. Off the chain. Oh, and we had real parrots in there. Yeah, yeah. Remember the parrots that were yeah. the big yeah. parrots in the cage? Let me tell you something. I remember Rick James hitting the stage. He was high. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I got a picture of it. It's on my, it's on my Instagram page. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Mike Tyson, Robin Gibbons, they used to come to Eddie Murphy. Anybody you can name was it that Red Parry. Let me tell you something. Back in the days, a lot of you don't know, for you younger generation, the industry used to party with the 
if you want to say the average folks and there was a level of you weren't average because we all were in the same place the only difference was that there was a vip room oh we had a vip room you know, right vip was uh, a vip room was not everybody that thought they was somebody special who got in the vip room you really had to be vip to get in the vip room now don't get me wrong back then all these names that reggie is dropping party we all partied in the same spot let me tell you something the red part the red parrot was off the chain three off seven one chain. Was off the chain justine's was off the chain it was small as hell but it was off the chain and i think okay. people, people love crowds if you didn't love crowds you wasn't partying back then so that's why today, you know the funniest thing what you're saying think about it today we don't have clubs we have no. bars yeah bars and restaurants converting into a club yeah. These are yeah. actual clubs back in the day. And not only you just you didn't have to wait for to wait for a promoter to have a special event. You want to go out on a Friday and Saturday, you would go to not just one. You would it's called cam I used to call it cameo. Cameo appearance. We go one place, get in the car, go to another place, get in the car. You go to five, six places in one night, and each and every place was wall to wall. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? Oh, listen, man. Casablanca. That's probably why I lost my hair from partying so hard like that. Hey, <laughs> check this out. I'm with you now. <laughs> Yo, hold on, Reg. We're going to get into some more history, but I just want to give a shout out to a lot of people that are chiming in. I'm going to uh, shout out to all of you. For those that are sharing this as a watch party, please understand, I can't see it, so if you have questions put them in here and i will ask the legend also I want to shout out to sadiq for soul summit he's been shouting you out he's giving you big props he wanted to say hey man this is a wonderful god introduced um got introduced to reggie dj wells by my sisters who were older too young for justine's and, and, and nell's wins were the hung of uh, he said Nell, where they hung out but would bring the music home to me when I got older at the Red Parrot, I was fascinated by Reggie, major influence on me. That's Sadiq, the Soul Summit uh -huh. on Brooklyn. I don't know how we're gonna do this, Sadiq. Holla at your boy, we're gonna, I wanna interview you, we can chop it up. Shout out to Tony Toon, co-signing this. Shout out to um, Howie D, shout out to Carlton, just giving back energy and love. Yeah, Carlton, TNT, Howie yeah. D, Lady D yeah. Wells, Yes. Be Fat, Hollywood, Eddie Chiba, yes, uh, yes. Ruben Toro. Yes, uh, shout out to Ruben. I mean, yes. I, you know, and rest in peace, man. You know, we lost two major and uh, two major guys in the music industry. You know, Tommy Allen. Yes. And DJ Lance, man. Yes. That, yeah. that was a great loss. Let me tell you something. It, it, it hurts us all, especially me being a promoter that I still wear that title, even though I don't do a lot of things like that anymore. But I think I've delved into that legendary aspect of being a event planner and I'm, I'm blessed to do that. I think the evolution of Bill, the four star general, all that is doing the real talk aspect. It's just, I've been blessed to interview Reggie for, what was it, the 35th thing and, and Rich, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Johnny number. Kemp. You know, we was all in there for your anniversary party and things like that. Uh, shout out to Red Alert. He just chimed in on the group. Red, please, we need you. We need you. We love What's you. up, Red? Yeah, we got history in this in this in this group. The boo boo connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Red, Red. If when, if I interview you, I, I'll have the Mayas. I promise. So let's get back to the Red Parrot, the celebrities. Let me tell you something. Remember when we was with I, I ran? We were together. And I'll be sure said to me, he said, yo, Red Alert's here. I mean, not Red Alert, Reggie Wells is here. And I said, yo, Reg, Al's over here. I'll be sure over here. He said, you know, I play for his wedding, too. <laughs> I play for Al B's wedding. So let me just talk about ooh, that. Play, that. You know, oh, let me tell you that, you know, I played for so many weddings in my career. Right. And what touched me the most, um, when the people hired me to play for the wedding, they told me, they said, Reggie, man, if it wasn't for you, 
playing the music that you was playing. We used to come to Justine's on a Thursday. I met my fiance at Justine's. I met my fiance at a at a party that you play for, a party that you gave. And um, they would say, Reg, man, you kept us on the floor. We thought we had shit in common. We came back every Thursday after work at Justine's. That's the place that we was going to meet. We on the floor. We buying drinks. We exchanged numbers. And down the line, they got engaged. And they said, Reg, if it wasn't for you, I would have never met this, my, my fiance or, you know. Uh, and they said, well, since you started us off, you had to finish us off. So I would yeah. play for their wedding. Yeah, I mean, and, that type and, of And I have to admit, uh, for those that don't know, uh, Reggie played for my wedding. Shout out to Reggie Wells. Oh, that's right. I, oh. <laughs> yeah. I've been in Cancun. We was in Cancun. We took out, <laughs> I tell you, I took 100 deep Double out there. I said hello. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Shout out to my other half. My bless you. I love you. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Let me tell you something. And let me say hello to my cousin, Tracy. Tracy yeah, said, yo, Tracy, just give a big shout out. He used to work my door at the Crane Club. Now, you remember the Crane, the hottest place on Sunday nights, right around the corner from Chaz and Wilson's. So, so I want to talk about that. We're going to go back into some all the historical stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. shout out to George Harrell, one of the founding fathers of New Jack Swing. Good shout out. Brother always gave me love when I used to come up to Uptown Records and things like that. So, What's up, George? George. So, you know, we got some legendary people that are chiming in and listening. You got questions or anything else? Please just shout them out. I'll read them off. I'll write them. I'm doing. I'm doing a multi, multitask thing right now because I'm talking to a legend. Um, it's a beautiful thing right now, uh, Reg. So let, mm -hmm. let's delve into this. Um, you was a DJ, a prominent DJ. You 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 held down different spots for years. But, but along doing the private in the, in, in, uh, private events, because a lot of times you can have your own establishment, but you can do private events. Tell me what made you delve into the promoter aspect? Because just like anything, actors, ra like rappers delving into the acting field, rapper, actors can get upset. Promoters can get upset when they see a DJ all of a sudden thinking like he can come into the promotion game. What made you do that? And you've had a, a long, illustrious career as a promoter. We've promoted together. What was that spot? Iguanas or some shit? Iguanas, right. Yeah. Yeah. Like we did that on a Sunday night. Yeah. So let me tell you, what made you delve into just doing promotion, uh, promoting at one point? Now, like I said before, I was promoting, you know, with Jerry Production, Harold Maynard, and myself. You know, yeah, we shout out to Harold Maynard. He's in the group. He's in here too. Shout out to Harold. Right. And we used to do a lot of major events like Ipanema's, Casablanca, Cork in the Bottle, um, all the color constellation. You know, a yes. lot of places. And so it was three of us. So when I became a DJ, and when these clubs had clothes. Didn't mean my career was over. Right. So I'm not going to sit, and not only that, I'm not going to sit back and wait for somebody to hire me. You know, you wait for a phone call or you wait for another club to call to see if you're available so you could be a house DJ. So what happened, I just decided, well, I know the ins and outs. Uh, behind the scene as, as a promoter, because I've learned that from Jerry, I've learned that from Harold and myself, and I decided to start my own production, which was RW and Company, and my own logo. And not only just give them the part, but learn how to negotiate deals. And that's the main thing, you know, going in there where you can eat, they can eat, where your back is not against the wall, and I used to come in there and tell them, I said, listen, I'm not thinking for a one-shot deal. I'm thinking about long-term, long-term, where we could build a re relationship. That's why I was at La Barback. You remember La Barback for a while? Sure do. I was at the Crane Club for a while. I was at Alhambra, which, you know, I, I had convinced them to start doing parties for a while. And um, then everybody jumped on. You remember the Lowe's New York Hotel? Yes, sir. I used to do the Marriott. Matter of fact, I did the Hilton, which is on Avenue of Americas back in 87. That was my 12th year anniversary, black time here. So I became a promoter. 
And you know, it's not easy because the difference is you have to put money out to, you know, you have to put money out to make money. So you have to invest. It's not where, you know, you plan for someone and you're going to get paid regardless if it's successful or it's not. You have to go out there, you promote, you have a staff, you put up money and whatever your expenses are, you have to see that back before you see a profit. And, uh-huh. it, you know, not only that, what becomes a promoter, because then, you, you know, sometimes DJs don't have personality. I hate to say it. Some of them, you know, you think about it. A DJ's in the booth before the crowd gets there. DJ's still in the booth by the time they leave. So, so you don't get a chance to really interact with them. You know, well, let me let me just interject on that. I, I, I totally concur with what you're saying because a DJ is in his zone and he plays music. I think G, a DJ's popularity comes from how good his following audience is, but there are mm-hmm. very few. And this is a, a big shout out to you, Red, and, and Hollywood, and, and other legendary DJs. There, there's so many to name a few, but I'm. And see, gonna... one thing about Red, man, I give Red credit, immense credit, because he he goes everywhere. Am I right or wrong? Yes, yes. He, from, Shout out to Red. He's Larry. not, you know, he you might know him as from the hip hop scene, but yes. he's in the R and B scene. He shows his face. He, you know, he's out there. He's keeping in touch with what's going on. I mean, if you call him, that man will call you right back. The yes, other day right. I called Dougie Fresh. He called me right back. I said, okay, okay. Shout out to Dougie Fresh. <laughs> Dougie Fresh, uh, my Harlem brother, Dougie. You know, and, and you gotta, Reds, get you gotta be out there. You gotta network. You gotta interact with the people. People gotta see you. And if they don't see you, you have all means today with them social media. You have something going on, man. You know, I yeah. should think Red was like three people. You see him in the video, you hear him on the radio, you see him in the club. Wasn't he out there until five o'clock in the morning? Red, I don't know how you did it, but you used to do it, man. But go ahead. <laughs> and, and let me tell you something, Red and I, Red, I need I need you to set this date up because let me tell you something. You and I was chopping it up on some history uh, offline and, and and you gave me some knowledge. And please, I, if you want to share that, please, I, I, I need everybody chime in, tell Red Alert, let Bill Foster interview you real talk. <laughs> so, you know, the beautiful thing about that is, we, see, you, Red Hollywood, have have, like I said, Legendary, when I say that, and I talk about the longevity of this game, you, on another hand, have reinvented yourself all the time. Reg- mm-hmm. Reggie, Reggie will pop up here. Reggie will pop up there. So let me ask you a question. Like you said, so how, you know, you rocked out with the promoters. Let's- and all the other promoters back then were, you know, rest in peace, Gene Pendergrass. Yes. Shout out to Gene. Rest in peace. No, you yeah. had... You know, um, black and gold, which still exists until today. Uh, Darren Hicks and yes. Mike, Mike Green, rest, rest in peace to Rudy. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You had, uh, we was talking, what, ba- Bachelors in Blue, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You had, right, Shout out to Bachelors in Blue that taught me, uh, I learned a lot from them too. Exactly. Right. You had brand new production. You had so many promoters back then, you know, which you don't have as many today like you had back then. Maybe you do. Well, maybe let me just say this. Let me just say this on a promotional aspect. You got a lot of people that say they're promoters, but they ain't promoting. Because let me just tell you this. From my aspect of promotions, when I got in the game, a thousand people in a spot meant the pinnacle of success or longevity at a spot. Because the, the, the thing about it is, you know, the Mars, the 2112s, you know, it, all, all right, the right. spots. Like when Mike and I was talking about things today, um, people don't understand what it took to put it. Like, when I see a promoter today, and no disrespect, but like my uncle would say, well, I'm being disrespectful. When I see promoters today do a spot, a, a bar, and you want to charge, and it takes six or seven of you to get maybe 70, 80 people. <laughs> yeah, all right. Not only promoter. six or seven, it might take them five months just to get yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell them, I tell them point blank, leave it alone. Yeah, you know, I yeah, lived yeah. off. See, I lived off this here. And then I lived off. I paid my bills. Yes. I bought cars from this here. Let me tell you so, something. Brand new, not used. You talk know, about Hollywood, Hollywood. Travel. Travel time. 
Hollywood's talking to me and shout out to DJ Hollywood. Hollywood, I need to say that straight up. You also told me, you said, yo, listen, there's no pension plan for, for, for DJs. So you have you guys have to set up how your whole survival skill game is. Like this is it's crazy. We listen. Well, I, it, 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 Go ahead. Yeah. You know, well, it's, you know, honestly, you're 100% right. It's good to have something like a job. I mean, we, it's what we do is a job. Yes. But, yes. you know, you're talking about somewhere you're paying, you know, you're, something is taken out for us for the long term. But, yeah. you know, in reality, if you're disciplined, if you know, you could take care of yourself. Believe yeah. it or not, man, there's things out here you can do if you're disciplined and, and you put certain things aside, you know, and, 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 and you know, you got mutual money funds, you got CDs, but you got to learn about it. You know, you, you have a, a, a savings bonds, man. You know, I used to buy them all the time. I walk past the bank, man, I got an extra $25 in my pocket. $50 <laughs> <in> my pocket. <laughs> I'm going to buy myself a savings bond. And the whole thing, you're not losing it, you're gaining interest on it. It has to mature within, what, five, no, six to 10 years. But you could, after six months, if you need that money, you could like cash that, that in with just a little tiny interest, but it's gonna mature within a certain amount of time. But in reality, you know, that's what I don't like about the business because we don't have no, no type of benefits far as working in a, a bar, working in a club, you know, and and um, that's a sad part about it because first of all, you know, as time goes along, you got earphones and you run loud music, you're gonna be losing your hearing. <laughs> oh, well, a lot of times, yo, let me tell you something, Reggie, a lot of people don't even understand this aspect of the promotional game. And we're gonna talk extensively about the Crane Club in a minute, shout out to Ron Grant, Lord, rest in peace. Rest in peace, right. So, but, one thing about promoting, like, listen, whole different animal. <clears throat> there are times when you had a, a fat house, you ain't have fat pockets. And people mm -hmm. didn't understand that, you know what I'm saying? Because promoting, I went to say about the people that I've, I've, I've dealt with in my past that I've dated, that you don't understand, you didn't take my promotional game seriously. Because as in DJing and, and promoting, it's, it's it's a good a, a feel good in uh, uh, situation, and people don't understand feel good. Just because it feel good to you doesn't mean it felt good to me because I'm working and shit. You know what I'm saying? Right, like right, right. I'm different mental. So you know, I wanted to read some things that people have said. Carlton TNT always said he said Reggie paid me even when the events didn't make good money. He would take me to the uh, to the ATM. And give me the rest of my money. Only him <laughs> did that shit. Uh, Michael Simmons said, "I'm listening to the the best DJ in the world." Great interview. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, some other interviews, like shout out to E Papers. Uh, a lot of, uh, like I said, Fred Fred Crew, DJ Red Alert is in here. Harold Maynard is in here. A lot of legends are in this building right now, and I appreciate you all. And um, Eventually, I will get to you during this uh, pandemic and coronavirus. I, I want you all to tell your stories. And what better person to tell you, to, to listen to your story for you to give it to your boy? You know, Bill, I have family members um, from North Carolina. I have family members from Florida. They want to tune in, I guess, because I did advertise it. What on your page. They should be on your page. If you share it, share it to your page. Right I did. There. I did. So they are in your page. Now, this is something new for me. <laughs> it's all right. It's something new for all of us. I want to give a big shout out to Robert Tate's in the building. I've always wondered how you doing, big brother. I'm glad to see that you're here. Turn your thing down, Red, so uh, put it on the because I'll hear you. Um, also, too, listen, Big Mike, Mike Blanton is in the building. Uh, Mike B. Mike B, what's up? That was my running partner back there. He'll tell you about the Red Parry. Yeah, so so let's let's no let's talk question, about right, Mike? <laughs> let's talk. Shout out to Mike, baby. Uh, let's talk about the Crane Club. What? Listen, for those that don't know about the Crane Club, it is it was epic on a Sunday night. 
let me tell you something. I'm probably, some people out there probably have lost their job trying to hang out with the industry. And on the Sunday night. On the Sunday that night. Because, on a Monday. Like, shout out to when, and, and, and I always say shout out to Red Alert and um, Jeff Fox. For when I tried to get into the music industry, Carol Anthony also too, when I tried to get into the music industry and do, that's how I started promoting for those who don't know. I uh, started doing a and um, and publicity for, for artists, but I was an independent individual and it was very hard for me. So with that being said, I was trying to come up and make a name. Michael Kaiser and I, I remember us standing outside the place passing out flies and, and things and like that. And then when the record, the industry and the record label and the radio stations, Red and, and, and Jeff would, would have me walk in with them to certain spots and they would sit there and talk to me and, and it's always meant something to me, the humility of these individuals because you, Hollywood, Starsky, uh, Eddie Chiba, a lot of times Eddie has, has, has rocked for me at my parties. Uh, you guys have a certain humility, you know, Grandmaster Cass, like, you know, Ellie Mel, like, your era has humility. Not you to know, say that the new generation, go ahead. Yeah, please. Certain things, some people that you mentioned, I, and Red and I, we talked about this a long time ago. <clears throat> we was out at the same time, but we was in different elements, you know. Mm -hmm. Red was better known as, you know, the hip hop. I was more like an R&B, you know, commercial DJ with a lot yeah. of versatility, put it that way. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's where you, you, you would never, you know, when people say, I'm number one DJ. No. No, you could be prominent. You could be foremost. You could be well known. Now, number one, because there's a variety of DJs out there. You don't know. I mean, there's so much music out here today. It's, it's so much reggae. I don't know all the major hits of reggae. I don't know all the major hits of house music. I don't know all the, the major hits of and the deep down rap music. So I will give you a portion of this, a portion of that, which well, it's enough for me to play a variety. You know what I'm saying? So when, you know, it, it's categories out here, man. It's categories out here. So it's not number one. You're well known, you're foremost, you, you're recognizable or whatever, you know? And that's the way I put it. They'll never call me number one. Say, no, I've heard that name before. Oh, have you been around a long time? And matter of fact, let me just clear this up, Billy. <laughs> I'll take, I'll a take lot you. of people yeah. think I'm older than what I am. And the reason why, because my name has been around for such a long time. I'm, you know, I'm not old as your mother, <laughs> but whatever. But and the reason why that happened and the reason why people think that way, you know how sometimes you could be, you could be in the music, I mean, you could be a DJ and all of a sudden people hear of you, but they don't know you already been in the business 10 years. Yeah. Now you're making a name for yourself. But I was fortunate enough to the point when I first started within that year, my name was, you know, I'm playing here, I'm playing there, or, you know, I'm MCing here, MCing there. So from, from the time I started until now, you know, I'm not 80 years old. I'm not 70 something years old. I'm just old. <laughs> Well, no. Well, let, let me tell you something. Just like oh, I was telling I'm you, I'm fine like wine. Put it that yeah, way. Exactly. You, Red, um, Hollywood. I think you guys. A lot of you guys. You know, shout out to Louis Baker. A lot of cats. But you guys have set the, laid the ground for what longevity is. You, you show guys. Shout out to Chuck Chilla. Yeah, yeah shout out to Chuck Chilla. Like, uh, we gotta give our radio oh, DJs oh, yeah. too. You know, Lenny but, Green, Fred yeah, Buckley. Lenny. But yeah. Oh, yeah. But let me just say this, you guys have shown that you can make a career out of being a DJ. So let me ask a question. Do Hold on, doing... okay, and we can make it, but it's still up to the public. The public right. is the one that makes you. The public is the one that makes an artist. People got so many artists and DJs, yo, get off your high horse, man. You know, because if without the public, it wouldn't be me, it wouldn't be no Beyonce. If you don't buy their records, they're in the studio, they're recording, right? Now they start playing it on the air. If you don't buy their songs, who are they? If you don't come to a club or dance to my music, who am I? 
You understand? So you right. always give a shout out and a thanks to the public. The public is the ones that make you. That's now, right. you know, and that's how I was able to maintain, sustain myself for a long period of time because when I do have an event, people come out and they support me. Not only they support me, they support me because they can reminisce about places that they used to go to. And a lot of them today don't know where to go because a lot of the young kids today are taking over everything. And everything is not hip hop. And there's no disrespect to hip hop. But yo, we need some grown and sexy stuff. Well, Reggie, I think you're probably one of a few DJs out there that played when, when slow dancing was, was in. You know? Oh man, that's before that's before I started DJing, man. Yo, we that, <laughs> we used to go to Stone Gym parties and the blue light parties back then, um, when I was in high school, they used to give out index cards, right? Really? And and whatever song that was popular at that time, matter of fact, I still got some. <laughs> All right, that's it. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, they were right. They were uh, 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 the title of the party was the name of that song. It would be uptown, fifty cents to get in. Bring your own brown bag. Wow. We have a Coke Forty Five, Martin. So, Rex, let me ask you a question. I, that, that's that's a beautiful thing. And something. Let me ask you a question. You guys, and I always uh, said at one point, the reason why we're here today, I always tell Red, Hollywood, and yourself that I wanted to interview you all together. But I think you all are deserving of your own story because you're all legendary. And here forth now, may everybody put legendary before your name. If you don't, then you, you're really a, uh, a fool because these cats have made us all dance for, for years and years. And I say that all because for three guys to come up in the same era and have your own lane, because you have your yeah, own see, lane. And I'm glad that you said that because that's one, one of the great experiences that I experienced when I was working at 371. You had four DJs, four DJs, that made, made a name for themselves. And Eddie Chiba, Junebug, Hollywood, and myself. That, even though Hollywood was, was the hottest motherfucker, excuse me, was the hottest No, DJ. you can curse. This is oh, okay. You can curse. Was the, curse, baby. Was the hottest DJ at that time. I mean, yo, he was doing his thing. I give credit where credit is due, but a lot of them don't give credit to me. And and some of y'all, when they're on it, when they interviewing your man, you know, show us some love with Reggie Welch. You know, I've been there, done that. I was there right. when that was going on. But okay. what I'm saying is that when Eddie got on, Eddie was Eddie. When Junebug got on, which he was playing for Hollywood, Junebug was doing this thing. When I got on, they knew Reggie Wells was doing this thing. And that was four of us, four DJs out of one place that made a name for itself. And the reason why I'm saying that because you have some places where you might have two or three DJs playing together, but one is shining more than the other. And the other ones are just playing, but the other one is carrying it. You know, in other words, he's on the team, but not the starting five. <laughs> wow. You know, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, he's on the team, but not the starting five. Hold, hold, he, in other words, he's a, he's a substitute. We got to put him in because the homeboy that was on the star fire got to take some got to take a rest but make a name for yourself when we put you in the game play the game right hold on let me just read this i just want to read this comment that would uh i think is deserving uh from uh my man mike green of black and gold shout out to black and gold my brothers in the business he said reggie had the crazy slow music set he would play late night at 371 ask him <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, you, you, you got uh, guys pressing, pressing. Oh, yeah, pressing. yeah, I used to do that. Yo, I, I, I used to do that, you know, because after the party, man, things was happening. <laughs> babies babies need to be made, right? Exactly. You know, you know, people was exchanging numbers. You might not go home. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you a question. How you how do you feel? Hey, Mike, Mike Green. Shout out to I'm Mike sorry, Green, good, my Black good. and Gold brothers in the business. Uh, let me ask you a question. You, you, you said something about uh, not giving props. Um, I think I, along with a lot of people in this business, give you that legendary status because you earned it, you deserve it, 
And if you don't give it to you, it's more than disrespectful. It's like not calling me Mr. when I go to a certain place. You know what I'm saying? When I'm spending my money, call me Mr. or sir. With that being said, how do you feel? I mean, uh, do the new DJs coming up, do they give you love? How, are they showing you love or are they not? Um, you know, uh, since with this coronavirus and everybody staying home and a lot of DJs are playing on Facebook and Instagram, right, right. and I would tune in just to hear them, see what they're doing, what they're playing. And, you know, I don't look at myself as, you know, putting myself on a pedestal or calling myself a legend. But, and some of the guys I don't even know, didn't even know that they play. And you know how when they play they can look on their screen and see who, who's tuned in. Right. And they were right, they put it, they, they start smiling, they rush to the microphone and they would show me love by saying, we got legendary DJ Reggie Wells tuned in. And I'm going like, wow. You know, so whatever I've done and whatever I'm doing now, yeah, they do show me love, you know, um, and respect as well, you know, but I'm just here, man. I have a passion for what I do. I love what I'm doing. And like I said, it's no me without the public. And, you know, if I could continue on doing what I love to do for more, more years to come, by all means, man. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, or question plus comment of you said that multiple times about know you without the public. One thing that I know about you, you are very hands on and interacting with your your the people that patronize you. Yeah. How did you do that? How did you get into that? You know, say for example, people hear of you, they see you, they see you on flyers, they hear your name on the radio, they 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 come to your event. Now, it's like a house party, right? When you have a house party, you are the host. So when they come to your party, and it, even though it's in a club, but you are the host. So you have to go around, mix and mingle, talk to them, you know, get to know them. And, and that's how I am. I'm a people's person. When I was in City College, I majored in communication. So that's a form of communication. <laughs> But I, I love people, man. I love people. They're interesting to me, man. I've met so many people over the years, man. It's it's uh, all walks of life. Man. Yeah, let me tell all you, something. that's true, everybody out there. Let me tell you something. I thought I could hang, but you ain't really hanging unless you hang out with Reggie Wells. I, <laughs> hey, Reggie, I'm ready to go. He'd be like, no, well, let's go one more spot. <laughs> oh, definitely. I was to get Yo. some people in trouble, man. They they'd call their girl. They said, yo, Reg, man, let them know, man. Yo, yo, I'm with Reggie Wells. I said, why are you going to do that, man? And one girl said, I don't give a fuck who you with. Bring your ass home. Fuck Reggie Wells. <laughs> <laughs> the party is over. It's 4 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. Yo, that's real you know, fact. You know, the funny thing, I remember my mom's, you know, my mother really didn't know what I was doing. This is a true story. And, Please tell and, 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 and she said, she said, Reg, you know, because I sleep all day, you know, because you're out late at night. Yeah, she's she said, Why don't you get yourself a nine to five? I said, Mom, what are you talking about? She said, Get yourself a nine to five. I said, Ma, I have a nine to five. She said, No, you don't. You sleep all day. I said, Ma, I work in the club business, all right? I, t I went to get, get shoulder a fly. I said, You see, Reggie Wells, DJ? See? The staff got to be there at 9 p.m. We open up the doors at 10 p.m. We close at 4, and we get paid at 5. <laughs> 9 p.m. Wow, to 5 a.m. in the crazy. morning. <laughs> and then we can still eat breakfast, right? You know, because before we go home, we go to, to the restaurant, eat breakfast. You mean, what was that place up there on Amsterdam Avenue? Uh, 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 um, Wilson, Wilson's? Yes, yes, yes. Shout out to yes. Wilson's. Yeah, Charles, yeah, Wilson's up there. Yeah, so I I have a nine to five, nine p.m. to five a.m. Well, I don't have society way, but I have it my way. Listen, I just <laughs> want to read some comments. People are, are chiming in. Uh, Gene Fox said, "Hi, DJ Reggie Wells. Wells does it well. He played at Justine's and Pegasus. He played it first always, 
had friends who stopped by and joined in. Carlton, TNT, our brother, people don't know how many. Oh, sound guy, call TNT, our sound man. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's in. He's oh, in. man. That was the man. Yes, sir. He's, he said Reggie pulled in business, got them in venues in Midtown. Yeah, Reggie pulled a lot of people too. Ha, um, Howie D, um, Wilson's, uh, Break First Spot, Alpino, Lisa, uh, Lisa Ray. What's up, Lisa Ray? Shout out to Lisa Ray. Uh, Lisa Ray, what's up? Tony Toon told me to say, I've got to go back to this spot. Yes, your cousin Tracy, just before, so you are uh, correct. They, she's saying about all you DJs, Red, uh, Hollywood, you all have your own lane. Um, Sin Sherry Brown Penn said hello. Uh, oh, Rodney, of course, Rodney, uh, Black and Gold is in the building. I'm just doing this. I'm rocking off at the top. Um, Tricky Lewis said red light parties. That's Reggie Wells. Michael Simmons said, I'm watching too. Tony Toon told me to ask you, Bill, ask him about the Hangover Tennis Club plus outing. Who, who asked that? Tony Toon. Was that in Brooklyn? I guess so. I don't know. I wasn't there. So I can't only talk about <laughs> that party. That <laughs> shit. Listen, all of you, there's so many people that's in here chiming. Um, big shout out to all of you listening to this legend uh, talk about how he got started in the business. Yo, let me ask you a question with this. Uh, we're going to get back to some other stuff because I got you and I'm going to run with you. But let me ask you a question. With this pandemic and this coronavirus, how are you feeling? What do you think is going to happen? You're doing the miss. You're doing the miss. You had a night. Nice, you have a nice run at the miss. You can shout out to the miss for uh, you. Let me tell you something. I, I tease you all the time. I've never seen a person go to one spot and run the shit out that fucking <laughs> Yo, I've been like, yo, let me tell you something. Everybody know, a lot of people that didn't know me from doing just the parties, you, you equate me to the one fish, two fish. And I, yeah, right, I was, right. in the perfect world. Right. I, I Madison Avenue. Right. Yeah, yeah, Madison Avenue. Good Avenue. Too. Yeah, I had a, yeah. But let me tell you something. Reggie, you get us, you get a spot and you hold on to that rascal and you run it, you run it. So let me ask you a question. With that, all that being said, when this is all over, what do you think uh, is going to happen with social distancing? You know, I, I think about it a lot. The nightlife is going to change drastically. You know, I don't know how we're going to overcome this here. People are still going to be leery about going out, socializing in a crowded environment. You never know, even though they could say the numbers went down as far as people, you know, uh, with the coronavirus. The numbers went down far as for people passing away, deceased. But again, how would we know, right? Yeah. They say people out here have it now, but don't have no symptoms. How would we know? They said, they said people will be. I mean, I was out, and I was eating while I was walking, and it was a pizza, <laughs> you know. And uh, I'm I'm walking, I'm eating the pizza. Almost choked on the pizza and cough, and the person next to me like almost ran across the damn street. <laughs> wow. And that's how people are paranoid. People are paranoid. I don't know what's gonna happen. You know, I have an idea of what I would do if we're gonna open up again, if we allow for a large crowd to gather. I have an idea which I'm not gonna share until you know it, it does take place. And um, where people could feel comfortable, you know, and, and not fearing that somebody's in here, they sick, and um, and they're gonna con con you know, come up with the coronavirus nineteen. Well, let me just say, let me just say this: uh, a lot of people, are like like Lisa Ray said, uh, get tested and stuff like that. But um, this is the new world order. Just close it for, and we get oh, all right. I know that's Reggie. You, you deserve that. You can own that. Uh, like, like a lot of people are saying that um, the days of wanting for weapons is might be over. What about like people are testing for 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 temperatures? And you know, are you a little fearful because this is your career right now? Are you a little fearful that this might put a damping on your financial aspect of this game? Because me. Like I said, I, I, 
I got to a point where I nip and tuck with it. I, I peekaboo with it. I know that I can do it anytime. Maybe like uh, egotistically, I may pop back in this game just to show somebody a youngin that I can I can still do it better than he can. But with you, this is right now. This is your. This is it. This is the foundation. My livelihood. Yeah, this is your livelihood. How do you feel about that? Hmm. It, it might come to the point where you you know how people might have to carry carry around some ID. They're gonna have to put something on your license or your ID identification yeah. stating that. You are negative. So when yeah. you come in and you show your ID, you know, and it's stating that hey, you you you're negative, you know, nothing is positive. I, I don't know. I think about it a lot. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing my you know, my people face to face. Um, you know, matter of fact, in June I supposed to be having my forty fifth anniversary, you know, forty five years of being independent, and I don't think that's gonna take place. Um, starting this month, May, I was supposed to start the after work boat ride, which was leaving from 125th Street. That's that's canceled. So right now, I don't know. I have to just wait and see. You know, we had three the hard way. We got Mayor De, De, De Blasio. <laughs> we have the governor, and we have the knucklehead, the president. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. We have to find out what three of them they're going to do for us to move forward. Man. Put it that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's scary. It, it, I mean, it's very scary. I mean, how long is this going to take place? We don't know. Yeah, uh, until it, they it come up with scary. a cure, something, you know, something they could come up with, and then I guess the society and the world will feel comfortable. Yeah. But believe me, your people out there, I'm out there. Sometimes in the front line, man, y'all need to wear your mask, man. Take those precautions, gloves, six feet distance, man, and, and take all the precautions, man. I don't want to lose a, I don't want to look on Facebook or somebody calling me and telling me we lost another dear friend, man. Well, listen, let me just say this. I, I think that we are the chosen ones. This ain't, this ain't Walking Dead or anything of that crazy aspect. I mean, but. The, the numbers of us losing people are astounding, I'm sure. Just like yourself, I always say this popularity has been a curse right now because I see more rest in peace and sleep in peace than I've ever seen in my life. And this is even me being a first responder in 9-11. Right now, being a person that's trying to see tomorrow, I can talk about it. I'll be glad when I see you tomorrow because the bottom line is this is a, a scary thing. And you know, people out there with pre-existing conditions. I got some feeling shout out to Wayne and other people in this industry, Lance, Tommy Allen, just people that are passing away. I lost my godson's mother, Margie. Look at that. Uh, uh, yeah. Rest in rest in peace to that. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the thing is really <clears throat> serious. Um have you had what, what was your mental uh with this whole thing, Reg? Were you experiencing it? anxiety like what like were you saying like yo this shit is crazy like i don't know anybody out there who wasn't scared who wasn't scared of this shit and when i say scared not the shit of like oh you're gonna be my ass but i'm just saying there's a had some attention of wow just, oh yeah i mean now you know you see like the other day i was outside over there on broadway and the funniest thing i'm seeing the mother wearing a mask and the daughter not wearing anything. I'm going like, okay, she caring about herself, but not her loved one, or her child. And the funniest thing too, you see people walking in dogs. Are dogs able to, you know, uh, 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 test, uh, well, they testing uh, cats. Cats have positive. Cats have cats have are, cats are positive yeah. more than dogs right now. Yeah. Really. Okay, you know, but anyway, I, it was, you know, then you see people on the train, you see the homeless people, they sleeping on the train, you know, I, I'll get up and go to the next car. You don't know what these people have. Right, right. You know, uh, some of the people, they're not taking it serious. One friend of mine that I grew up with, he wanted to talk to me. I had to say, yo, my brother, stand six feet, man. Stand yeah, yeah, give, give, give me my space. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I know how he's living, but he, you know, he's taking it. He's taking it lightly. 
So it, it, it's making me feel leery. It's making me look at people a different way. It's making me act towards them a different way, which I really don't want to do that. Well, let me ask you a question. Now, I had a conversation earlier about doing something community when this is all over. And let me ask you a question. This is more your livelihood. How are you going to feel about trying to put an event together and, and dealing with the, the separation for people of safety? Like, like the bottom line is, simple. We all know that this is a, a business, but I know you personally. Yeah, yo, it might have to come to the point. Listen, it might not. It's, it might have to come to the point right now. If you may have a big event with a, a large number of people coming together in, in a, at a social function, you might have to get to the point of you know how to go through metal detectors for weapons. Right, right, right. You might have to screen them. Yeah, do I just want to give a shout out to your, your cousin Tracy. She said yes. Back into this real quick because I'm, I'm gonna stretch you to nine o'clock. She said, "Yes, he put an unknown venue on the map. Yes, he has. Once DJ Reggie Wells started, then it was open field for other promoters to do their thing." Go ahead, Trace. I, I, and, but you know what's so funny, Reggie? No, uh, I, I know what she's saying. You know, I'm the type. I have a vision, and if I feel that something. They, you know, even when I started Miss, right? People were saying when I was advertising Miss, they're gonna say, "Oh, Reg, man, uh, yo, you know they don't have a, a, a real liquor license. You know they don't sell real liquor." I said, "Yeah, I know." And they said, "Well, good luck." I drink wine. They were serving wine, beer, champagne, and fruit punch. I still, even though they had doubts that it's not going to be successful, it wouldn't take off. I believed in it, and look where it, look what happened. It took off. How long I mean, have you been at Miss now? Right? At huh? How long have you been at Miss now? Uh, this year would have made three years. Okay. This year would have made three years. Um, yeah, but. A lot of things that happened at Miss was out of my control. Cool. So, so I mean, well, right. The way it started, I mean, the way the direction that it was going lately was out of my control. Well, things are different, and we don't have to talk about that unless you want to. Because the one thing about the title of this, uh, my, 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 I know it's real talk. Chronicle. It's real talk. So it, it is what it is. If you say it. I will never stop you from saying it. No, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I'm still dealing with them. Yes. So hopefully if this is over with, we, we go we go back to the drawing board and we're going to start from the top, you know, how I started. But, you know, it was out of my control. Don't blame me for what goes on behind the scene, even though I was the promoter. But, you know, people that know me, they know for a fact, you know, that's not my call. Let me ask you a question. Talking about promoting and DJing <clears throat> and segue into the top of the hour. Um, when you, you and I, we went, shout out to my our boys, Mark Smooth and, and Cozy, what they were doing in the summertime. But you like the music that you were listening to. So when you hear DJs now, Reggie, and and as a DJ, and 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 oh, you you're humble enough. You know, Dome that title as legend, but you are legend because the longevity in the game, legendary status. So please own that, you know, with humility. It's nothing wrong with that. I think you, Red, Hollywood, you all have a certain with it. That comes I guess what after a certain amount of years, and you yes. still exist. Yeah, 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 and and and, and you know, pretty, you're pretty to, successful at what you do, and and that's what comes with it. Let me tell you something. I, I, I give shout outs to the promoters that came behind me. And when they asked me to come to their event, they would say, well, who do you want to come with? And I thought that was just so, so humbling to me that you knew I was OD on my, on my guest list. But they would say, like, yo, come with, I want you in there because you validated my shit. And, and I respected that. And, and I always promote them like that. You know what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. 
lot of times for you out there who don't know, when somebody would say this is uh, approved or in, in conjunction with or some kind of love with that. But not to deviate from what my question was, what do you like feel about the new music of today where, you know, what music? Exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what, what we are. Uh, I mean, it seems like everything is hip hop. All right. Everything is hip hop. They they would say I was reading an article where they were saying that the hip hoppers today are the singers. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We have a I mean, if you if you try go to iTunes and they have different categories. You have pop, you have reggae, you have hip hop, hip hop R and B soul, then you have R and B. Look at look what's listed. And look what they have, what, what they consider R&B today. R&B stands for rhythm and blues. Not some, you know, hip hop r and I'm going, really? I want to hear, I, I mean, I, I love rap. I love the beats. But I want to hear somebody sing to me, man. We got a handful. You know, we got the ushers. We have, you know, you know the ones that's out there. We have the Mary J. Blige, you know. But the majority of them is a small portion of them. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, the groups. Have, have, have you changed? Big condition, no longer. What you're saying is that you didn't change to the crowd. You made sure that you stayed with your crowd. Your crowd, you put you have to. Yes. I mean, I have an older crowd. I have an R&B crowd. You know, right, listen, right, you right. have some young people today, they come through, they say, Reg, I love this here. I can't deal with my age group. They crazy. They, I said, why you say, well, if you go to their party, you got to come there early. And you got to leave, bro. <laughs> but something might jump off. Instead of just coming out and having a good time, dancing some good music, go home, have a good night. But, you know, they... The beautiful they thing is, about, everybody the beautiful thing about our crowd. And, you know, this and that. And, I mean, come on. I remember I, I was negotiating a deal with uh, a club owner. And the first thing he told me, you know, um, well, how many cases of champagne are we going to sell? I said... I'm not basing my, my crowd is not based around that. You know, if, if some want to buy a bottle of champagne, fine. But if they want to buy ordinary drinks like a rum and coke, some hennings, you know, Patron, fine. But we not, I, my crowd is not based on serving bottles. You know, then he said, uh, I tell you, what, I'll give you a good deal. And I don't think this guy was hearing me. He said, well, I'll give you a good deal. I said, okay. He said, if you buy a case of uh, what, what's the high champagne, Cristal? I don't know. I'm a Tito's drinker, so he said Cristal. He said you got the place for free. I said if I told you my crowd ain't based around just drinking red mo, I mean, <laughs> red hey, got, red got, mo got you tight for a second. Got you tight. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I said, are you hearing me? I said my crowd's not based on what he, Who's going to be drinking Cristal? This is no. This ain't no industry party. This ain't puffy. You know? I've hung out with some of them, man. You wouldn't believe they tab, man. It's incredible. Tab 10,000 in one night. I'm looking at them like, really? But you, you know, when you do shit like that, you can write that shit off because that's an industry party. <laughs> so let me, yeah, uh, yeah. And back in the day, let me ask you a question, Reg. Uh, give give the, the listening audience a kind of who's who or who you hung out with or played with during this, uh, not- I played for? Yeah, played for in your um, career. I used to play for Spike Lee a lot. I played for a lot of his, his early movies. You know, they call them, you know, once they finished the movie, it was a, a rap party. I played with Spike Lee. He used to fly me out to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Then the following year, could they have the homecoming for Morehouse and Howard University. And I, I'll be in Atlanta, Georgia one year. And then the following year, I'm in Washington, D.C. They would have the homecoming in Atlanta one year. Then they had the following year in Washington, D.C. I played at the post office pavilion, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the museum today. Yes, it is. It's the museum today. And that's where I met you. Right, doing the butt? Doing the butt, yeah. And, you know, they EU is a go-go group. You know, grow, yes, sir. Grow music very big in DC, very big in the DC area, right? Maryland and DC. I 
play for Mike Tyson. I used to play for uh, TriStar Movie Theater. I want movie um, company. Yeah. I played for this company. They used to have me out there in the Hamptons. And they used to have me at the big hotels. I remember this hotel. I can't even remember the name. I pass it a lot. It's on Fifth Avenue. It's near 59th Street. It starts with the P. And the craziest thing, man, they hired me. I played for a half an hour. It was, they had half of the rock kids there. They had a big orchestra band. And this is New Year's Eve, right? Mm. And if you wanted a drink of champagne, they gave you the bottle. You finish that bottle, you go get another bottle. <laughs> that was the wrong label. Like, oh, and, and, and when the New Year came in, I will never forget this. When the New Year came in, they brought, they did the countdown. They had a champagne toast. They finished the food. And they was out of there around about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. I would told them, man, keep this place open. Let me make a phone call. Y'all got too much. <laughs> too much liquor shit, guys. Yeah, don't let this shit go. I said, yo, where the people go? They was they was there around about 8 o'clock when they dropped that ball. When they did that count, countdown and that new year came in. They left within a half an hour, 40 minutes, man. Uh, I want to uh, give another shout out to Black and Gold. My man, uh, Mike Green, said... He said, please ask Reggie if he would ever go back to radio. I remember when he was on WBLS. He has the voice, personality, and experience. Would you ever go back to uh, radio if they asked you? Oh, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. You know, for some reason, I, you know, I was on the radio, 98.7 KISS, as a master mixer. I was doing a show at one time with Tanya Simpson and myself. You know, we were talking back and forth. It went pretty well. The ratings were pretty decent, but I don't know what happened with that. Um, back in the day, WBLS, when they was doing live broadcasts, you know, on location at the Red Parrot or the Master Mixers, this and that. But if they more than willing to hire me, man, I'm more than willing to um, be available, come back, do my thing. You know, age is just a number, man. I still love music, and I still think I still got what it takes to do what needs to be done. <laughs> And, 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 and that's very key because uh, a lot of people don't know when I was managing Lady D. Wells and I was doing things, shout out to Lenny Green, we were doing um, uh, stuff for the radio station, listening parties, and uh, that's how Lady got with the uh, radio station. And mm -hmm. Reggie was supposed to play that night also too, but the bottom line is because Wells, Wells were very nice, because Lady had played for Reggie a lot, he gave <clears throat> To, to shine and then she ended up getting the gig so you know this all nepotism and, and working with each other and also, yeah you know Reggie the beautiful thing about the radio was great you in such that you definitely had the voice uh, my buddy, well I'll tell you what you know if if WBLS or was no more 98.7 kids in film I could start my own radio station my core letters would be W E double L S. And that stands for the world. You always say that. Yeah. It would stand for the world's exciting, long lasting sound. How you like that? Well. <laughs> <laughs> so so Red, let me ask you a question. Um I I I I dub you legendary. You are that's why this interview, let me tell you something, for all the people that are watching and, and sharing and listening to this, I appreciate you. This is Real Talk Chronicles. I'm your host, Phil Foster. And I wanted to bring legends to the forefront and, and give you something different. I mean, I've definitely been engaged highly into this coronavirus, COVID pandemic aspect, but I wanted to bring another light to this, just a little mellow it out. And I asked Reggie, along with my other brothers, to to be a part of this because I think let's give people their blood, their flowers while they're living, and you know to be a friend and have the opportunity, the platform to give him his his venue to share his story. I thought it was just something that was deserving, and and I'm so glad that you even took the opportunity to share your story with the people out there listening. And I applaud you to go back and chime in and, and comment and 
reply to all these people that are has making all these nice comments and love in terms of endearment to you. We are doing great at this time. Uh, I'm going only hold you for another five minutes, but when you look back on your career, what would you do different, or or, or maybe what? Well, a lot of things are, I would have done different. I mean, you know, back then you had so much fun. You, mm -hmm. you would never think it would stop because anything I wanted to do, I was able to do. Any place I wanted to play, I was able to play. So, and when you're having fun, you don't look at it as a business. You know, you're looking at it like, okay, this is what I do. The people come. I'm not thinking that they're coming on the strength of me. I'm not thinking they're coming to listen to my music or to dance the music. I'm looking at, well, I'm working at a prominent, you know, a prominent club. But as far as behind the scene, negotiating deals with club owners and promoters, you know, times I have worked with promoters where they didn't even give me a deposit. And I said, well, pay me the night of. And they vent as far as uh, wasn't it wasn't uh successful as far as making money clientele wise but they their expenses override their profit so they wasn't able to pay me you know and I, I just let it go because I was working so much I mean I won't tell you man I would I would work like I said Tuesday at Justine's I'm back there Thursday Friday I would do an after work right after work at Justine's leave from there go to another party until four or five o'clock in the morning, then wake up Saturday, play for a wedding, and then after the wedding, play for the boat ride, because you remember back the day liner back in the day? The of boats course. would leave at 7.30, come back at 12. And then from there, I would go and play at the after, after party. So that's how busy I was, you know, and, 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 and constant every week, every week. It was like that for a long period of time. You know? I, think, I think it's so different from from today in comparison to when we party is that like I said we had and, uh, and, oh, 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 oh. Oh, and let me tell you you remember what I told you which I surprised a lot of people when they never knew I've never owned a sound system in my life. If you live next tell door, about that. To tell them about that. If you live next door to me, you would never know that I was a DJ. I wouldn't play no music. I never owned a turntables, a mixer, speakers, amplifiers, anything like that. Never. I was playing so much where I learned how to play with the people by being in front of me. I was playing so much to the point where when I got home, I didn't want to hear no music. I was playing so much to the point where you know, whatever the radio station was playing was repetitious, so it was nothing to listen to. You know, so that's how much I was playing. That's why I never owned the sound system. Just within the last four to five years, believe it or not, I bought myself a controller. I think four years, I bought myself a controller. And how I bought that controller, I was downtown on Canal Street, Canal I-5, that stereo store, I knew the owner, I knew the guys, the manager, and they haven't seen me in a long time. I just happened to step in the store and, and they asked me what I'm doing. I said, well, you know, just promoting. They said, Reg, you're not DJing. I said, not really just promoting. I said, I want to get back into it. They said, Reg, it's never too late, man, come on. They the one that convinced me to buy a controller. Really? And rest in peace, Tommy Allen. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I had a passion for what I was doing, and plus I had love for the game, and plus it came to me kind of naturally. Not to say I'm still learning today because these DJs, the way they scratch and that tricky shit that they be doing, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> if, I scratch, I might, if I scratch, I might take the whole turntable with me. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me just say this. I got to give a big shout out to Lady D. Wells, your namesake. I went to an event one time you guys were doing. I don't know who was doing it. Oh, right. I was so excited. You know, I talk about this all the time. And I always said, I do a party and just had Which me. was beautiful. And that was, yeah. I, I know, I remember that. Yeah. And let me well, tell you something. What you two did 
one would put on a record and play a record, and the other one would have to go on the other turntable and play the other. And select record. another song, right? And no. it's like putting the puzzle together. Okay, D, she was listening to me. I'm playing the song, so she looking. That's when we playing vinyl, right? Yeah. And she, I'm playing the song. She looking through her crate. She tapping her feet. She looking through. Okay, I got something for that. Then she'll put something on. I'm listening. I said, okay. I got something for that too. And at the same time, we it's like she selected something, I selected something, and we never lost the crowd. And those people didn't even know what the hell we was doing. We were just up there having fun. You know, that's when you know your music. That's where you're not playing by a format. That's where you plan from the top of your head. And that's where a DJ should always play until this day. You should have at least 10 records or 10 songs go to one. So you don't play by a format. This week, okay, say you playing this song right now, you got a selection, of, a wide selection that could go to that. Then you you playing this song, another wide selection you could go to that. But at the same time, you don't lose your crowd, you maintain them on the floor, you motivate them, and you're taking them somewhere. And that's what it's all about. And don't forget, the public makes you, and the owner of a club and the promoter of a, a venue is the one that gives you the opportunity to, to show the public what you can do. You believe yeah. that? Yeah, I, absolutely, dog. Let me give a shout out to K-Mel. Uh, What's up, K-Mel Checkmate Entertainment? Yeah, man, yeah, yeah. My condolences yeah. to your brother, man. Oh, Sorry yeah, respect, brother, respect, man. respect on that. I just want to read off some things. Uh, your cousin Tracy said, thanks for, uh, thanks for me for doing a great job as the interviewer, of course. Uh, Cassandra Dewey's shout out to Cassie and, and Dewey's Kumo D's brother uh, Dewey building too. Kumo D. Yeah, yeah. Wow. She said I had my 21st birthday and Justine, my dad, had such a good time. He was he was break dancing in the middle of the floor. He loved the music Reggie was playing. Sky Williams, I know that's right. I was your you Uber back in the day. <laughs> okay, Sky Williams, uh, <laughs> Uber uh, driver in the back of the days. Uh, with the a, a case of records in the trunk and the breakfast at Wilson's in the morning. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, you know, what's so funny that the history, the longevity of, I think you are timeless. I think Red is timeless. I think Hollywood is timeless. Even though this is about you tonight, I always equate you guys because you are all my friends. And, and, and I. Four Star Entertainment. Bill yes, Foster. thank you, sir. That's I it. get it. Yes, and and, and, and and you know, all of you have played for me, so there's a special connection. Shout out to Eddie Chivas, the Rest in Peace, Love Rostovsky, B Fat, the, 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 that crew, that era. I think Tommy I, Guns is on there, DJ Tall Guy. Yeah, Paul <laughs> to TNT, uh, Tall right. Guy. A lot of, listen, that era was. And so KC, the Prince of Soul. Yes, shout out to KC, dancing. Sweating, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was us three back then. It was Carl, 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 the sound guy, KC, and myself. Yeah. Never yeah. had that. When I when they booked me, I called Carl. Carl knew where to go. He knew what to bring. KC and I worked together. Never rehearsed anything. He just knew where I was coming from. I would feed off of him. He would feed off of me. How powerful is that? So yeah. Rick, let me ask you a question. Uh, we're going to bring you back because we have no choice because. Your, your plethora of knowledge and history is impeccable. And it, two hours just seemed, we would just want to do, I just wanted to give you an hour, but let me tell you something. People kept chiming in, chiming in, chiming in. So they wanted to see you. So listen, we're going to bring you back. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, you I look in. forward to being there. I mean, look yeah. forward for and, you and having I hope you had a good time. But what I want Definitely. You, I want you to. This is just like playing music, man. When you're having fun time seem to fly by yes, without yes. you know what they say when you're having fun time seem to fly by yeah we've been yes, talking yes. about something that it's important to me you're asking major questions you i'm reminiscing you're bringing back some old memories and yeah. i didn't realize two hours went by that quick it, it sure didn't I mean, let me tell you something i didn't think it did because the beautiful thing about this is that when you're chopping it up with friends and 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 you are my friend. Don't let anybody else out there think you. It's not Kid Capri. Let me give a shout out to him too as well. Shout out to Kid Capri because let me tell you something. He has revolutionized the game. He's taken party promoting 
and height yeah. of the out. Uh, I think he's a blend of all of you guys put in together. Mm -hmm. And I think he's humble enough to acknowledge that. I think, let me ask you a question just before we go. Are, are, like, uh, I think we already talking about, are the, are the new, is the new generation humble to you guys? Like, um, no, no, they, they show me love. They show me, you know, okay. They show me a lot of love and I appreciate it. I respect them, what they do today, you know? Yeah. Um, some of them, they want, you know, the funniest thing, see the difference when they, they want to go old school, but the songs that they playing, I was playing them when they was, they, when they first came they, out. They, they first came out. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So they, and then, you know, it's a difference, you know, they playing because that's a classic. But when they first came out, hot off the press, straight out the box, put the needle on the track, separate the music from the wax. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I might, I might, uh-oh. <laughs> I got to you know, so, but I still can so, do man, it. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. I enjoyed myself immensely, man. Hello to everyone that tuned in. God bless you all. Stay safe, man. Um, let's overcome this epidemic that we're dealing with right now. And hopefully when this is all over, we can all come together, see each other face to face, reach out and touch somebody, have a conversation, get our little drink on, our dance on, and go back to the way it used to be. Listen, listen, everybody. This evening, Friday, uh, in May, I've had a legend here forth now. Let him only be called legendary Reggie D. Well. <laughs> My brother, I appreciate you. We've done parties together. I've, I've enjoyed our friendship. I've enjoyed watching him play music. I think talent is talent. I think some people are built for certain things. Yeah. And I think <laughs> he was built to socialize. So, uh, uh, <laughs> and show love to the, the world by his hands and his voice. Let me tell you something, I'm so proud of you. Uh, I, I, I wish you many years more success. I, I always say, I tell Red, Hollywood, anybody, if I ever get to that. Say hello point, to Chris Johnson too, you know. Yeah, Chris like, Johnson, shout out to Chris. Talking if I Larry Love. Spot, if I ever own a spot, you guys know that you will always have a-, a Mark Austin. Yeah, you Mark, know. yeah, shout out to Mark. Mark did the flyer. He did the logo for Four Star Entertainment. Oh, okay. Sunday, or, or Sunday. Uh, I think Malika and I, she's here. She, uh, we, we might just have, instead of couples in quarantine, we might just have a Q&A for us and couples in quarantine. If you can ask us anything you want to, we just might chop it up real quick with you for an hour. Monday, we have Mr. Dr. James McKnight coming in talking about the psychological aspect of opening up the country to this pandemic. Are you ready for that? That's a whole different avenue that we're about to delve into. Uh, he's going to talk about the whole psychological aspect of that, anxiety. Wednesday, I don't know if we're going, I don't know if wife is going to do ladies in quarantine or we might have some other stuff in that, her, her own round table. We're going to get back to a lot of things. Listen, um, legendary, his fourth now, and forevermore, may he be only called legendary, <laughs> DJ Reggie Wells. I appreciate <laughs> Thank you so much. On thank you for, thank you, Bill Foster. Thank you, Malika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bill yeah, Talk. Yeah. Come here, it's outside of here. She's going to come in. I, I, hope, I hope it was interesting. I hope the people enjoyed what we was talking about. Yeah. At, it's at much more. Time, it's much more. Means. It's Anytime, much more. All means, man. We're Just gonna get more deeper, 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 deeper into the history. We we might break down each spot. Let me tell you something. When a person like him has different spots, as he said, Justine's Red Parrot, you know, uh, Miss 371. We, Small's Paradise. Small Paradise. All the bomb ballroom. So we might have to go Nana. segments, segments. Go ahead, the park, the park Run them off. Run off. Run them off. Go ahead. Plaza. The Kali Braun. Oh man, you could go on like us. There's even the Celebrity Club, Charles Gallery, Harlem World, the yes, Rennie. Sir. See, I went from down, I went from, I was in the Bronx, I was in Harlem, and I went downtown to the Palladium. And the largest club that I ever, ever played for that accommodated 5,000 people was Bonds International, right there in the heart of Times Square. Remember that spot? 
Bonds International, that was a department store. And they converted that into a club. Bonds International, that was incredible. Man. I wish I had, you know, we had phones back then. Even though I had a phone that was in my car back in 1981. That, that, that was shit that was like this. Like no, it mounted to the floor of my car. Yeah, it was like this. He was like, hello. I got a picture. I did the Broken Bell Hotel. The shit was hanging. You remember the cars had the little antenna in the back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, I had a phone in the car. That was okay. My my first bill was more than my car note. <laughs> I turned that shit off. <laughs> Quickly. Quickly. Everybody. Wait, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you so much for DJing our wedding. Oh, thanks for having me, my. We enjoyed ourselves. Camino and I, we enjoyed ourselves. My wife is showing her vanity. She says her hair's not done. I'm trimming my ends, but Reggie, thank you. It was incredible. Exactly, and that's why. Thank you. And it was beautiful. It was a great experience. I was drinking mamusa, whatever. In the morning, the afternoon, and in the evening. Yeah. yeah, listen. Don't tell her what I did when I was getting my dance on. No, 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 no. we don't need to know that. What, what happened in Cancun stayed in Cancun. It stays in Cancun. But right. let me just tell you this on, 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 for, for one person that's done three three things with you, like I said, promotion, promoting with you on Sundays at Iguana, which was, it was a great experience, you know, watching you do your thing, uh, doing your birthday parties at um, our main, what was it Armenian Hall on on the east side? Mm -hmm. the, uh, Mike right, Edmund, right, we right. that, and, and rest in peace to Kenny Dinkins for that too. So I mean, there were just certain things that, and you know, just your collage of people that you have worked with over your history is just epic. You know, I, I I really like I said, I applaud you, I appreciate you. On behalf of Real Talk Chronicles, ladies and gentlemen, introduce you to the legend. Reggie Wells, DJ Reggie. Thank you. On behalf Thank of you. Chronicles, on my other half, my significant other, the love of my life, Malika Forster. I am Bill Forster. This is Real Talk Chronicles. Sunday, a QA, just Malika and I, maybe. Right? They're going to ask us questions. Ask us questions. The anything you want to ask us is how our relationship manifested, how we're dealing with this whole coronavirus nonsense. You know, don't ask me what I think about 45. I'll tell you, your feelings might get hurt. And this Monday, Dr. James McKnight, we talk about the psychological uh, manifestations of what it is like to be going out when the country opens up. So please tune in for that. I will be back with more legends. Trust me, in the martial arts, in the promotional world, it just, the, but I really want to get these legends in, like, like Reggie, Hollywood, uh, 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 DJ Red Alert. Tell him, tell him, let your boy Bill Forster interview you, man. Let me tell you something. If you want to be a part of Real Talk Chronicles, what you got to do is send, send some information. Just let me know if it's something that you want me to interview somebody on. If I can get to them, I will. If you want to listen to what Real Talk is doing, send a friend request to Real Talk Chronicles. Maybe send a friend request to Malika Vaughn Forster. Uh, I think I'm at my numbers, but Send a friend request, email me, inbox me. If I inbox you back, we can you can watch all the shows. Let me tell you something, Reggie. It's been epic. People are chiming in. They haven't stopped. People are talking. I Shout out to Harold Maynard. Harold Maynard. I wasn't in New York. I was in Philly. All yeah. this year, the only place I've been to that you mentioned was the Palladium. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know no, that. no, no, that was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was beautiful. Oh, no, don't do that. Like that song says, "Static." Don't start. Don't be that. <laughs> New York. I, I, I'm coming over to have my glass of wine, Pinot Grigio. Yes, yes. yes. Come on over. They close at nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Reggie, stay on. Everybody else, Facebook Live. Love you. Talk to you in a minute. Peace. Yeah, yeah, Red, so we're offline.